So one instruction for all the students who are joining and uh, who have already joined. I'll keep admitting new students who are requesting to join uh, this session. All participants are required to mute their mics and turn off their video chats. Any communication with me will be through the chat box or the comment box, right? And uh, you must be receiving the YouTube links via NPTEL for all these sessions. So these sessions will be recorded sessions and I'll upload, uh, I'll upload the week practice problem session on my YouTube channel and PMRF NPTEL, NPTEL will send you the link for this channel, right? So let's let's begin with, th with that much of in uh, instruction. Let me post it in chat box once again. At the end of the session, we'll try to solve 10 questions and uh, at the end of the session, I'll try to share the uh, YouTube link for the folder containing all the videos from practice problem set 1 to practice problem set 4. So, I'll be sharing my screen now. To the participants, is my screen visible and is my audio clear to everyone? You can just respond by yes or no through the chat box. To all the passive participants, can you see my slides changing and is my audio clear to everyone? Then we can begin with the assignment series. You can just respond in the chat box. So students, this will be an interactive session and uh, I'll, I'll keep asking questions and engaging all the participants throughout this problem solving session. And you should be, you should be on your keyboards and on your uh, mobile phone keypads to answer these questions and respond to me, so that it can be a fruitful session for both you and me, right? So okay, yeah, it seems like my voice is clear. So once again, welcome you all to nanotechnology in agriculture, the course that uh, we are. Let me switch on my laser pointer and. Uh, the course instructor for uh, this course is Professor Mainak Das from IIT Kanpur and my name is Ashutosh Behera. I am a PhD scholar PMRF at IIT Kanpur and I will be the TA for this course, right? So meanwhile, I uh, will again request all students to turn off their mic and video chat and I will keep admitting new students who are requesting to join. Let's start on with the question number one. So this is corresponding to all the lectures in week 4, right? And uh, I, I would like to request again students to turn off their video chat and mic and let's try to solve this question 1. The first question I will uh, I'll read out for everyone. Oxidation state of iron in iron pyrite is dash. Option A minus 2, option B plus 2, option C plus 3, option D plus 4. So students uh, try to answer this question. What is the oxidation state of iron in iron pyrite? So it's a pretty basic question. If you are aware, if you are aware of basic rules of oxidation number in chemistry it will be easy for you guys to answer and I encourage all these participants to try to answer 
even if you do not know the correct answer it's okay if you just guess it but participation is the one that we are looking for i'll reveal the correct answer at the end i'll wait for a minute for students to answer and then we'll see what is the reason why the answer is the correct answer i'll wait for some uh, time for people to answer okay so there are already some answers cool lokesh says plus 2 swetha plus 2 vinay plus 2 lal charan plus 2 jivantam plus 3 dhanush kumar john most answers are plus 2 some people are uh, one or two people are saying plus 3 cool it's good to see that people are students are participating and responding let's see what is the correct answer the correct answer is plus 2 so congratulations to all the participants plus 2 is the oxidation state of iron in iron pyrite okay now let's move on to the explanation so where did iron pyrite come from Iron pyrite is also found as a iron ore mineral also known as fool's gold is an iron sulfide with chemical formula FeS2 and it's also written iron 2 disulfide here this 2 represents the oxidation number so iron pyrite is also known as fool's gold found in mines and pyrite is the most abundant sulfide mineral so for any material pyrite is the one which is most abundant form of sulfide of any mineral and this is how iron pyrite looks like so this is an ore of iron pyrite it looks very shiny mirror kind of substance and very beautifully formed crystal lattices here cubic forms it also known as full gold because it's shiny but it's not actual gold and now the property that oxidation number of an element in compounds what is oxidation number total charge of a neutral atom or molecule is zero total charge of an ion is the ionic charge so this is the trick to find out the oxidation number here are some examples so neutral atom oxidation charge oxidation number is always zero o2 zero o3 zero h2 zero cl2 zero because these are neutral atoms but in ionic substances like nacl the ion has a charge which is the oxidation number so nacl here na has a charge of plus 1 and cl has that's why when we dissolve nacl in water we have two kinds of ions na plus and cl minus that's how we denote it so the oxidation state of na in nacl is plus 1 because it's written as na plus and then in cl is cl minus similarly here kmno4 this is another example so the total charge on the molecule is neutral zero k here is plus 1 manganese here is plus 7 and o here is minus 2 so minus 2 into 4 four molecules of o minus 8 and then this is balanced by plus 1 of k manganese plus 7 so plus 8 and minus 8 so that's how we calculate the oxidation number so for our molecule fes2 here see this is if we break down the chemical uh, chemical formula into oxidation charges this is how it will look like fe will carry a plus 2 charge on its head while sulfur each will carry a minus 1 charge so that's how fes2 would be formed if it dissolves in ion so the oxidation number on fe is 2 plus now if the question would have been reverse what is the oxidation number on sulfur then the answer would have been Minus one because each sulfur moiety has minus one on the charge. That's what uh, determines the oxidation number of an element in a compound, right? Now, here in nano technology, we have uh, iron pyrite nanoparticles which have a wide variety of use. Here we can see scanning electron micrograph images. of iron pyrite nanoparticles looks like this in 2d 3d <coughs> and they have various applications here applications in rechargeable battery photo detector photo capacitor photo catalyst so iron nano pyrite nanoparticles have application in various fields right 
and there are two kinds of methods mainly used for iron pyrite nanoparticle synthesis some of the physical synthesis methods are sputtering sputtering is the method of physical vapor deposition in which we purge the material with a gas and uh, then force it into a plasma state and deposit on the substrate electrode deposition is also a method of physical vapor deposition and spray pyrolysis where we use heat energy in electrode deposition we use electrical energy for kicking out ions right for kicking depositing nanomaterials and chemical synthesis methods we have chemical vapor transposition or deposition these are the methods in which iron pyrite nanoparticles are synthesized in industry and these have so many uses so our question was what is the oxidation number of iron in iron pyrite the answer is plus 2 and we have a, we have now come across some methods of synthesis of iron pyrite nanoparticles and their application is it clear to the students is it understandable what uh, we are talking about is it clear to the students you can just let me know type yes or no in the chat box it's good to see that students are participating uh, so much nice and uh, we expect more participation so for your information there are almost 85 to 90 students attending uh, this this uh, problem solving session at once is it clear to the students i'll wait for a minute and check the responses okay cool yes sir yes sir yes yes nice nice let's move on to the next question okay so the next question is a little lengthy question reasoning read the following sentences i'll read the question out for you number 1 water purification using nanotechnology exploits nanoscopic materials such as carbon nanotubes and alumina fibers for nano filtration this is the statement 1 statement 2 it also utilizes the existence of nanoscopic pores in zeolite filtration membranes as well as nano catalyst and magnetic nanoparticles and the third statement says nano sensors such as those based on titanium oxide nano wires or palladium nanoparticles are used for analytical detection of contaminants in water samples right so we have learned these are the three statements now the question asks is which of the following is correct option option a all the three statements are true option b statement 2 is false option c statement 3 is false and d says statement 1 is false i hope students can all see my screen and i'm also reading out the question loud so that uh, those who are facing any problem in their internet issues can at least hear me so it's time for students to answer this question you can just try to guess the answer read the statements carefully and choose the correct option so this maximum participation is needed for fruitful conduction of this session and i would uh, request all the participants to mute their mic and turn off their video chat and any interaction will be via the comment box so i'll wait for a minute students can take their time and answer the question which of the following statements is true or false and this falls under the area of water purification using nanotechnology what do you think will be the right answer you can just you can just write the mention the option in the chat box or you can just type out the answer what do you think is the correct answer it's okay if your answer is wrong do not feel shy be confident enough to answer this is a practice problem session right so even if you are wrong your marks are not counted here it's better if you correct your mistakes here and know the reason why the right answer is the right answer and why your answer is wrong we'll understand all the reasoning and logic behind the answers so please try to answer this question regarding water purification using nanotechnology 
Roshan says statement. Okay, let's see. Let's uh, let's hear what others have to say. I'll wait for a minute more since very few answers are coming up. Come on students, you, uh, you can just guess any answer if you are finding it difficult. Then we'll see what the majority is agreeing with and what is the correct answer. Yes, yeah, yeah, I hear you, but uh, please type your answer in the chat box because there are so many participants. Turning off our on, turning on our mic and video chats will be too chaotic, right? That's why I've uh, made this rule that all the communication via the chat box. Please, I appreciate your effort. Please type your answer in the chat box. Okay, there is uh, one more answer. Says B. Statement 2 is false. Let's see what is the correct answer since uh, let's not wait much time. Okay, now answers are popping up. So, 4 to 5 students are saying option B is the correct answer. Let's see what is the correct answer. The correct answer is option A. All the three statements are true. Statement 2 is false is not the correct answer. Statement 2 is also true. We'll see why statement 2 is true and why all the statements are true. Let's see what uh, what is the first statement talks about. The first statement talks about water purification using nanoscopic materials such as carbon nanotubes and alumina fibers for nanofiltration. So here is an, a representation where carbon nanotubes are used. These, this is a membrane containing carbon nanotubes where water purification is carried out, carried out. This is a form of water purification called desalination. Desalination means we convert the sea water into fresh water. We all know that sea water is salinated with lots of salt in it and we cannot use it as drinking water. So this is a method in which salt water can be converted into fresh water. May it be sea water, hard water or any kind of. Where on a membrane there are fixed carbon nanotubes and this water is distilled in fresh water. Right? There have been extensive studies on some rising water treatment application like removal of heavy metal ions, oil and water separation, water desalination which we saw here and the rising pollutants in water by utilizing carbon nanotubes based composite membranes. So this is a composite membrane made up of carbon nanotube and it can it can be used for so many uh, for so many functions like removing heavy metals from water, oil water separation and desalination and removing contaminants and pollutants. So the statement one is correct. Carbon nanotubes can be used for are being extensively used for water filtration. And the statement one also mentions use of alumina membranes. So this is also a tube-like structure covered with aluminum, alumina uh, fiber meshwork. And this is the process where oil water separation happens. Oil field produces water, enters through this, and uh, which adsorbs the oil drop droplets on the surface, the alumina meshwork, and lets out the pure water. So alumina material is generally used either as a membrane support or as a membrane layer due to advantages provided by this material and its derivatives such as ability in tonnage quantities, chemical inertness, good hardness and thermal stability of porous texture during elaboration steps. So alumina material makes the nanotube very durable and thermal stable, chemical inert and it is also extensively used in purification of water. So statement one is true. Statement 1 mentioned about carbon nanotubes. 
So if you look at statement one again, carbon nanotubes and alumina fibers. Now statement two said use of zeolite, nanoscopic pores in zeolite, and magnetic nanoparticles. So this is a schematic showing how magnetic nanoparticles can be used for purification of water. So if you follow my cursor, from a wastewater treatment plant, the effluent from secondary treatment will be treated with advanced magnetic nano adsorbents. So many magnetic nanoparticles will be added into the secondary effluent which is from the wastewater treatment plant. Now what will do, what these magnetic nanoparticles will do, they will adsorb all the inorganic and organic molecules or the contaminants onto themselves and then using a magnetic field we can sort these magnetic nanoparticles. Now the magnetic nanoparticles are attached with all the dirt and pollutants and contaminants and with the help of magnetic field we will just pull out these magnetic nanoparticles which will leave behind the purified water and then again using reverse magnetic field so north pole to north pole repulsion attractive and repulsive magnetic field if you use repulsive magnetic field this micro pollutant loaded magnetic nano adjustment can be also separated so we can separate these contaminants we can also regenerate these nanoparticles and use it again for the effluent treatment and while obtaining purified water so magnetic nanoparticles are extensively used in sewage and wastewater treatment plants so one part of statement two is true the other part says talks about zeolite nanopore membrane so zeolite nanopore membrane is already used as nanotubes and filters where we have sodium zeolite membrane which will have organic treatment so water from organic wastes like from fields and crops and any sewage plant when passes through the zeolite membrane functionalized with some function functional groups organics get dehydrated and the pure water molecule is led out of the tube and these uh, sodium zeolite membrane are used as ceramic support in many nanotubes just like alumina material was used as a meshwork so statement 2 is totally true magnetic nanoparticles as well as zeolite nanopore membrane are both used for used are both already used for water purification system so if you go back to statement 2 it also utilizes existence of nanoscopic pores in zeolite which we saw as well as nano catalyst and magnetic nanoparticles magnetic nanoparticle use in water filtration we also covered that and the third point is the use of nano sensors so to summarize magnetic nanoparticles have been commonly tested as adsorbents for the removal of pathogenic and polluting compounds from water so magnetic nanoparticles are very good in removing pathogen and polluting compounds from water and zeolite for its porosity is used for water filtration because it makes for an excellent medium and what are the characteristics of zeolite which makes it a good water purifier has the ability to filter out variety of solvents it also is a low cost material production is low cost zeolite is heavily resistant to abrasion <laughs> abrasion means mechanical damage caused by uh, caused by these organic compounds or pressure and it is also an eco-friendly water filtration method so we saw that zeolite and magnetic nanoparticles are used in water filtration and the last point here is a schematic showing that water laden with toxins heavy metals pesticides hydrocarbons can all be treated with nano sensors which can be nanoparticles or biomolecules and these will have some uh, fluorescent or detection properties which will have which can have optical property electrochemical property or mechanical properties which can help us in detecting what kind of substances these nanoparticles have attached to so this is kind of quality control of the water let's say we have a nanoparticle which can specifically recognize heavy metals and upon binding to heavy metals there will be an optical change let's say a fluorescent molecule will fluoresce 
then that signal can be processed in a unit and giving us the information okay so this water is now loaded with heavy metals so it, these nanoparticles can then act as used in nano sensors for checking the water quality control right so nano sensors are also applied in uh, water purification systems so all these statements 1 2 and 3 are true so the first statement was carbon nanotubes alumina material are used in water purification the second statement zeolite membrane nano catalyst magnetic nanoparticles are used in water purification and the third statement said nano sensors are also used in water purification is it clear to the students you can just mention in the chat box so the answer for this question will be all the three statements are true is it clear to the students great 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 students are responding and uh, it's a good thing please keep participating we have many more questions and uh, we have ample time to solve them and uh, keep up all the enthusiasm and participation let's move on to the next question so this is again a statement uh, type question there are lot more statements six statements now students have to read all these statements very carefully i'll read out uh, the question once read the following statements the first question is statement is carbon nanotubes are allotropes of carbon with a cylindrical nanostructure statement 2 depending on their manufacturing process cnts are categorized as single walled nanotubes and multi walled nanotubes respectively and question 3 besides having a high specific surface area cnts possess highly accessible adsorption sites and an adjustable surface chemistry fourth statement says due to their hydrophobic surface cnts have to be stabilized in aqueous suspension in order to avoid aggregation that reduces the active surface fifth question fifth statement they can be used for adsorption of persistent contaminants as well as to pre concentrate and detect contaminants and the statement 6 metal ions are adsorbable by cnts through electrostatic attraction and chemical bonding so these are all the six statements now we have to select what is the correct option all the all the three statements are true not three statements all these above statements are true sorry for the typo statement 2 is false that cnts are categorized into single walled and multi walled statement 3 is false like high specific area surface area adjustable surface chemistry or statement 6 is false metal ions are adsorbable through electrostatic attraction and chemical bonding so which one of the options uh, do you think is the correct answer please let me know in the chat box So you you have to read all these statements carefully once again i'll give you some time it's a lengthy question students who do not uh, know the correct answer do not feel shy be confident and just type your answer even if it is wrong no issues we will see what is the rational behind the correct answer right i'll wait for a minute and uh, collect some answers before we move on to the correct answer you can just mention which option do you think is correct a b c or you can just write the statement all the three statements are true or such statements will also suffice there are some answers uh, in the chat box roshan says all the three statements are true louis says uh, one John says three. Magesh is saying a. Cool. I'll wait for a minute and uh, let other students read through the question and answer. We have ample time. Do not worry. 
and at the end if you have time le left then i can take any specific doubts uh, regarding the problem solving session or the lecture week 4 which you must have already read because it's time for lecture 6 now right <coughs> So while students are answering these questions, I would like to point out why these problem solving sessions are structured in a way such that live sessions are uh, going on, live lectures are going on in week 4, uh, problem solving sessions are going in week 4 while the new fresh material that is coming out is week 6. So these problem solving sessions will act as a mode of revision for you guys so that you do not forget your back lectures. And uh, if you and it's not pos always possible for the student to go through all these uh, lectures simultaneously on the day of their release. So even if you have piled up lectures to complete, you can have a big help by attending these problem solving sessions where I'll be revising concepts while answering these questions. That's how these sessions are designed to help students. Okay, it's time and let's see if uh, there are more answers. Oh, nice. There are many answers now. Lal Charan says 1. Komal says 1. Dhanush 1. Vardhan 1. Bhushan A. Chajan 1. Okay, that's... Uh, let's move on to the correct answer. Let's see which is the correct statement. Correct answer. So, all the three statements are true. So, all the above statements are true is the correct answer. So all these uh, are related to carbon nanotubes. Now let's move on to the explanation. So this is a representation of single walled and multi walled CNT. So this was the statement number two, right? Statement number one is uh, pretty obvious. Carbon nanotubes are allotropes of carbon, obviously, with a cylindrical nanostructure because it's a tube shaped structure. And CNTs can be categorized as single walled or multi walled. So, this is how a uh, multi walled CNT looks like. So, here we have three layers of uh, these uh, nanotubes. This is a monolayer nanotube, this is a bilayered nanotube, right? And the third point. They have accessible surface, but the surface chemistry is adjustable and they have many adsorption sites. This is the third point. Besides having a high specific surface area, they possess highly accessible adsorption site and adjustable surface chemistry. The surface of these nanotubes can be modified and adjusted with surface chemistry. They can have different functional groups. They can have different properties which will change the usage of these carbon nanotubes in materials. Let's see some of these examples. So functionalized uh, groups added for non-polar or planar chemicals adsorption decreased for polar chemicals adsorption increased. So if we need, if we need a non-polar, uh, if we need this carbon nanotube in filtering out non-polar chemicals, then we add such a functional group where adsorption is decreased for polar chemicals and adsorption increased for non-polar chemicals. Right? When the catalyst is removed, adsorption is increased and it is acid treated. When it is graphitized, means these layers are uh, made up of graphite, not graphene, at 2200 degrees Celsius, functional groups are removed and this nanotube can now be used for polar chemicals, adsorption will be decreased. For non polar chemicals, adsorption will be increased. And if amorphous car carbon is removed from this nanotube, Metal catalyst is oxidized, adsorption is increased. So these are some of the processes in which we can modify the type of nanotube we are using by just adding or removing some functional groups or changing the properties of the material used in the nanotube. So carbon nanotubes are very flexible and have adjustable surface chemistry and different adsorption sites for their functionality. So statement 2, 3 and 1, 1, 2, 3 are all true. Now let's move on to the next statement which talked about hydrophobicity and aggregation of CNT. So CNTs are very hydrophobic, tend to aggregate in aqueous solution because of high Van der Waals interaction forces along the tube outside. 
so tube a tube outer surface is hydrophobic due to high van der waals interaction and what happens when uh, two or more such tubes are present these tubes will try to aggregate to each other reducing the water contact between the outer surface of the tube while bringing two such hydrophobic tubes together there will be uh, reduction in thermal energy so aggregation but aggregation will reduce the active surface of the tube so now that the tube has aggregated with another tube the surface which was earlier accessible is not accessible currently so that's why aggregation we do not need aggregation in cnts or carbon nanotubes and cnts can be designed through specific functionalization or modification process designer cnts can enhance contain contaminant removal efficiency so so the concept is similar to the functionalization of cnts we can add certain groups in cnts which can enhance the contaminant removal efficiency of the cnts so it can be uh, used in removing contaminants from any process cnts can facilitate recovery and regeneration of nanomaterials and cnts hold potential application in waste water purification and desalination so we already saw a use of carbon nanotubes in desalination membranes so it holds huge potential application in waste water purification and this is a schematic showing how carbon nanotube membranes can be used for filtering water this is also a process of desalination so here these red molecules are water molecules red and white water molecules from saline water like sea water has salts we have filler and there are certain functional groups on the cnt because cnt can be modified functionally which will adsorb all the salts on its surface and only let the water molecule to pass through giving us pure drinking water across the membrane so this verifies all the statements in the uh, in our question where we had they can be used for adsorption of pers persistent contaminants to detect contaminants hydrophobic surface to ag avoid aggregation reduces the active surface and metal ions are also adsorbed through electrostatic attraction and chemical bonding so metal ions are positively charged they are attracted to negative areas in cnts negatively charged areas like the oxide ion in the uh, carbon backbone in the graph uh, carbon backbone if there is functionalization of the carbon nanotubes with some modified functional groups metal ions can bind through electrostatic attraction or chemical bonding and there are allotropes of carbon single walled and multi walled nanotubes high specific area but adjustable surface chemistry so all these statements we saw that they are true so the correct answer would be a all the three statements are true is it clear to the students you can just let me know in the chat box and we'll move on to the next question is it clear to the students if not you can just tell me i can repeat any part of the uh, slides that we are seeing because the explanation part is the one that holds key to all the knowledge and your revision that's how you will revise upon all these uh, topics which were in the past lecture week 4 and those who haven't still yet come across lecture week 4 then this will have a good impact on you while you are reading those right is it understandable to the students what i'm talking yes yes nice thanks so there are few responses so students i would request again everyone to uh, to try to participate in these question answer session so this is not a one way lecture kind of thing where i'll just be delivering the information so this is a active problem solving session and uh, it will be very good if all the students participate alongside with me in solving the answers be confident do not be shy out, do not shy out to answer the questions we have lot more questions to answer if you haven't gotten the chance let's move on to the fourth question this is again of a statement related question and this is about nano silver so this is the hint i'll read out the question for everyone 
nano silver has been used in photo development process since late 1800s and has been registered with environmental protection agency for use in swimming pool algae sites since 1954 and drinking water filters since 1970s second statement says although nano silver exhibits a strong and broad spectrum antimicrobial activity it has hardly any harmful effects in humans and the third statement it is already applied to point of use water disinfection system and biofouling surfaces now which of the statements do you think is the correct one all the three statements are true statement 3 is false statement 2 is false statement 1 is false which of the options do you think is the correct answer all these statements are about nano silver you can let me know the answer that you think is correct in the chat box i'll wait for a minute and let all the students answer read all these statements thoroughly and uh, what do you think is the correct answer so we have almost a population of 95 students at least let us collect 10 to 15 answers it's okay if your answer is not correct be confident and just try to put an effort into understanding the question there are some answers coming up in chat box roshan says all the three statements are true vinay is saying option 2 and louis says option 1 let's more for a, uh, some more answers students i'll encourage everyone uh, to go through the question and predict the correct answer you can type in the comment box komal says 2 okay let's see if there are some new answers shweta and anjali both say one bhushan says a Magesh A, Surbhi says A. Okay, cool. Let's see what is the correct answer now, without uh, further delay. The correct answer is option two. Option two says statement three is false. It is already applied to point of use water disinfection systems and biofouling surfaces. So, say statement three is false. Now let's talk about nano silver and find out why statement three is false. So the first statement talked about nano part nano silver in the use of photography. So there is a method called gelatin silver process, which is the most commonly used chemical process in black and white photography, and is the fundamental chemical process for modern analog color photography. So back in uh, 2000s and 2010 we used to have camera with films and reels which were then developed as a negative and all these development process happened through gelatin silver process in which the chemical common chemical used was agno3 nanoparticles and in this process uh, these agno3 nanoparticles were dipped uh, were made into a colloidal solution and these are light sensitive which used to uh, glow and leave dark and uh, light spots which used to turn as a negative in black and white photography nowadays we have uh, many advanced uh, cameras which do not use films but this process of gelatin silver 
is also a fundamental chemical for process for modern color photography also and this is a representation of these spots dark and light spots from silver nanoparticles and this is how a camera film looked like and silver nanoparticles are also used in heavily in water pollution monitoring and treatments so this was the uh, this was the second point right no this is also in the first point that it is registered for use in swimming pool and also some of it is used in drinking water filters so here silver nanoparticles are used for pollution monitoring and treatments many nanopart many silver nanoparticles have are, have been known for their bactericidal and mic antimicrobial activity so agnps silver nanoparticles have strong strong inhibitory and bactericidal effect against various bacteria fungi and viruses agnps are stable on the foam and are not washed away by water and also retain the morphology of the foam after coating so another advantage of silver nanoparticles is they are very stable on the foam so they are not washed by soap and can retain the morphology of the foam after coating so this is this is the method of production of uh, silver nanoparticles and also an advantage why it can be used if efficiently as a water treatment uh, method because it doesn't wash away with foam it will stay on the water and do its antimicrobial property the toxicity of silver including nanoparticles of silver to humans is generally low which describes the second point to humans silver nanoparticles have very less effect although this this statement here is very debatable since there are many recent studies which are saying that if uh, if in a high concentration these silver nanoparticles can have adverse effect in humans so this statement is a controversial statement but at low concentration humans uh, do not have any reactivity towards silver toxicity so in our day to day lives skin contact with textiles containing silver is one of the main ways people are exposed to silver nanoparticles in general consumer products release only a small amount of silver not resulting in significant health effects so that's what we talked about whatever consumer products we are using which contains nano silver they do not release significant amount of silver that can cause health effects we also have many sweets nowadays coming with silver uh, foil so those also are direct silver where direct silver products where we are consuming it but we, that does not have any adverse effect on the human health at that low concentration so it's not affectable uh, directly harmfully affecting the humans and the third point which made that uh made the statement that silver nanoparticles are used for water disinfection i'd like to bring your attention to commonly used water disinfectants like chlorides and bleach which disinfect the water disinfectment uh disinfectants kill all the microorganism inside the water the good bad and all precipitate out all the organic stuff whatever is in the water so silver nanoparticles functionalization for water disinfection live bacteria virus can come here by live bacteria virus laden water then these silver nanoparticles can attack these viruses and then uh, these water can be devoid of all organic based disinfectants all organic based nanoparticles so but yet uh, yet there are alternative state strategies for application of silver nanoparticles so the answer to this option this question is a little debatable but yet now yet till now most commonly used water disinfectants are chemical based uh, disinfectants of chlorides and bleach and silver nanoparticles might be used in swimming pools and other uh, other areas and lesser used in uh, drinking water facilities while they they have been approved there needs to be advancement in technology which minimizes the health effects if uh, or adverse side effects to the humans because silver being a heavy metal group can also scientists have the say that 
silver can have an effect on human cells if ingested so commonly used water disinfectants disinfo disinfection of water silver is fine but for for approval and uh, usage in filters silver uh, and biofouling surfaces silver is not an already point of use water disinfection so even i am a little in a debatable state for this answer but but this is the correct answer that statement 1 and 2 are true and statement 3 is false because it's not uh, already applied to point of use water disinfection so is it clear to the students the application of silver nanoparticles in photography in uh, water pollution disinfection and how it can be may or may not be harmful to the humans and research is still going on to perfect the silver nanoparticle strategy to use it in filters meanwhile the common bleaching agents are disinfectants are chlorides silver is not yet approved it has been shown to have uh, water filtration properties though is it clear to the students you can just mention yes or no yes yes cool nice great good to see that uh, students are responding and participating let's move on to the next question which will be oh we have something yet left nano silver yeah this is what i mentioned nano silver is yet to be approved globally to be used in water disinfection so the next question is again uh, a statement type question now we have a shorter question we have two statements here and uh, these questions are related to ground water purification right so i'll read the statements the use of magnetic nanoparticles magnetite fe3o4 for separation of water pollutants has already been established in ground water remediation in particular for the removal of arsenic and the statement 2 says conventionally applied pump and treat technology for ground water treatment comprises pumping up the ground water to the surface for the treatment usually by activated carbon for final purification now out of these two statements which of these do you think are false or true based on the options option a statement 1 is false option b statement 2 is false option c both the statements are false and d both the statements are true so students please go through the statements carefully and select which is the correct option for the answer let us collect some answers and then move forward i'll wait a minute for your responses so these these statements are about ground water filtration one statement is about uh, use of magnetite and the other statement is about pump and treat technology for ground water purification you can just mention uh, which of the option is correct which of the option do you think is correct in the chat box i'll wait for a minute i hope you can read uh, the questions presented on my slide even though i'll be repeating them uh, talking to you once again you can just mention uh, your choice of answer i'll wait for a minute seems like louis roshan a very attentive good three answers say option 4 both statements are true let's collect some more answers i'll wait for a minute more students please uh, try to answer answer i'll encourage everybody to participate in this discussion so that this problem solving session is a two way discussion just due to smooth conduction of this session i have requested all of you to turn off your mic and video chat but still uh, we can have conversations in the chat box regarding the answers surbi says 4 komal says 3 magesh says 
four. Anjali, John are with four. Okay, let's not uh, let's not waste any more time and see which is the correct answer. Option four is the correct answer. Both the statements are true. So magnetite in usage of groundwater remediation is true and pump treat technology is also true. So option four is the correct answer. Right? So on my left here is a schematic where magnetite is used for removal of arsenic. This was the statement one. So groundwater if contaminated with arsenic, heavy metals from industries or in fertilizers or groundwater gets contaminated by sewage drip or something. These black stars are arsenic. Now what we do, we add a magnetic adsorbent. Here is the magnetic absor adsorbent is the Fe3O4 nanoparticle, magnetite nanoparticles. These nanoparticles will uh, adsorb all these arsenic on its surface due to its surface property higher surface area for adsorption and chemical modifications. Now we can cleverly use a magnetic field because the nanoparticle is Fe3O4 has magnetic property. We can just use a magnetic field to remove the uh, nanoparticle and which is in complex with the arsenic or the contaminant. This is what is represented here arsenic plus magnetic absorbent surface adsorption. Now, when we use the magnetic field to separate out the uh, nanoparticle containing all the arsenic, what we are left is with purified water. And this uh, abs adsorbed nanoparticle, magnetic nanoparticle of Fe3O4 can then be treated with NaOH or other some chemicals in a process called desorption to give us to regenerate the nanoparticle, free nanoparticle, magnetic nanoparticle and arsenic. So we can again use this free nanoparticle in this step and we can keep reusing it until our convenience and this is such an efficient way of purifying ground, ground water where Fe3O4 is used for arsenic removal. So Fe3O4 magnetite nanoparticles, MNPs, magnetic nanoparticles are promising and novel adsorbents for AS is arsenic removal because of the great adsorption capacity for AS and easy separation. Fe3O4 magnetite is used for arsenic separation. Super paramagnetic iron oxide is also a name for Fe3O4 with a surface functionalization of dimercaptosuctionic acid DMSA and employed them as an effective sorbent material for toxic soft metals such as Mercury, silver, lead, cadmium ions which effectively bind to the DMSA ligands and for arsenic 3 which binds to the iron oxide lattices. Oh, uh, I think Roshan mentioned my voice is not clear. Am I, am I audible students? You can uh, I'll just pause for a while. Can you hear me properly now? Roshan, uh, could you answer? Is my voice clear enough? Then we'll proceed. Yeah, it seems like uh, students can hear me. You can just recheck your internet connection once and uh, rejoin. Right, we were talking about super paramagnetic iron oxide. So I was so talking about different functionalization of nanoparticles, right? So if we functionalize, functionalize these nanoparticles with dimercaptosuccinic acid DMSA. To this DMSA, the arsenic can com uh, complex to iron oxide lattices. This can also not only arsenic, it can also complex with mercury, silver, lead, cadmium. These are all heavy metal which contaminates groundwater. And these can all be removed with this functionalization. And then due to magnetic properties of Fe3O4, we can just use a magnetic field to separate out the nanoparticle, leaving behind the clear groundwater. So statement one is true. Fe3O4 magnetic nanoparticles can be used for arsenic removal from groundwater. And the statement two talks about 
a certain strategy called pump and treat strategy so pump and treat is a common method for cleaning up groundwater contaminated with dissolved chemicals including industrial solvents metals and fuel oil so this is also a technique for groundwater remediation it's called pump and treat so this is pretty simple <coughs> pump and yeah students uh, i would just request please switch off your mic and video chat yeah uh, please uh, please bear with me and try to switch off your mic and video chat for smooth conduction of this session yeah as we were talking about pump and treat technology so it's pretty simple the words that uh, tell us first step is pump so ground water is pumped from wells to an above ground treatment system that removes the contaminants so first ground water is pumped to the surface and then at the surface there is nanoparticle treatment and all sorts of treatment which will remove the contaminants and after removal of contaminant the ground water is pumped back into the soil where it came from so this is a representation illustration of pump and treat uh, pump and treat technology water plant so do not uh, uh, do not worry about all the complexity what we can see here is the arrow mark here determines that where we have this is the depth of the well well screen with here we have ground water not captured right and ground water is contaminated so first we pump the extract pump or extract the contaminated ground water and send it into a holding tank and in the from the holding tank here is the treatment chambers where we have activated carbon air stripper or any kind of nano materials in here also we can use magnetic nanoparticles so this can be any kind of treatment for the water and after the water is treated the water is again pumped back into the ground water ground uh, level by a reinjection well and these are all monitoring levels down gradient monitoring well up gradient monitoring well to monitor the level of ground water we are what we are uptaking and the reinjection and this is the direction of ground water flow so this is a schematic of pump and treat setup where we have pumping of ground water to the surface treatment of ground water using nanoparticles activated carbon carbon nanotubes or magnetic nanoparticles and then reinjection of purified water into the ground level back right the treatment system may consist of a single clean up method such as activated carbon or air stripping so this is how pump and treat method works so we saw that statement 1 which uh, stated about the use of magnetic nanoparticles fe3o4 in removal of arsenic and pump and treat technology uh, in use for groundwater remediation both these statements are true so our answer will be all these above statements are true now is it clear to the students are you on the same page with me you can just let me know in the chat box is it clear to the students sorry for the earlier inconvenience my voice was not clear you can stop me any time in the point where you do not understand we can go through the section again we can repeat it is it clear to the students oh nice yes yes cool cool thanks let's move on to the next question see the session is going so good uh, students are interacting we are solving questions together and then we are understanding the concept behind all these questions and the answers so it, this is the way of learning made fun and which can only be fun when students interact and try to answer so students who have not yet answered you have uh, four or five more questions please try to put in efforts and answer let's move on to the next question next question is a short question i'll read it out for you when some lattice sites left vacant while formation of crystal the defect is called dash 
when some lattice sites are left vacant while formation of crystal the defect is called a vacancy defects b interstitial defects c frenkel defect d kottke defect what do you think will be the correct answer let me know in the chat box take your time i'll wait for a minute first for collecting some answers and then we'll see which one is the correct answer which of the defects will be described when some lattice sites are left vacant while formation of a crystal is it vacancy defect interstitial defect frenkel defect or a scott key defect please answer i'll wait for a minute to collect some answers and i'll encourage all the students who have not yet answered try to even guess if you do not know the correct answer please try to guess put in the effort that's what is important i hope you can see my screen and read the question again yourself and try to think about the answer okay there are some uh, cool there are many answers now good and most of the students are answering number 4 Uh, is it for this number six question or is it for the previous question? John said three, Anuradha said D, Patel, Aditi four, Roshan four, Yashwan says four, Nagesh says option A, Purti Bhushan option one. Many of people have answered number four. Some have answered. John has answered Frankel defect. Magesh and Spooty says vacancy defect. Let's see what is the correct answer. The correct answer is A, vacancy defect. It's pretty obvious uh, from the statement. When some sites are left vacant, it's a vacancy defect. While Scott Key interstitial Frankel defects are similar kind of defects. So all these four defects fall under the category of what is known as point defects. point defects are certain defects in during formation of crystal and all these four are different types of point defect so the answer is option a vacancy defects so what are point defects missing atoms within a structure or atoms at wrong sides or wrong atoms are considered zero dimensional irregularities and called point defects so there are there are three types of phenomenon happening in point defects either either there are atoms missing within a structure either there are <laughs> atoms at wrong sites in a structure or either there are wrong atoms at same correct sites so these are all called point defects here is a representation showing showing the difference between frenkel defect and a scott key defect so for a scott key defect equal number of cations and anions are missing from their normal site decreasing the density of crystal so if we consider this as a crystal lattice the green ones are the cation pink ones are the anions so what happens in a scott key defect a cation and an anion always in a pair equal number of cations and anions are missing from their normal site so here the blue arrow depicts that the anion has moved out from its normal site and this green cation has moved out from the big leaving behind these vacancies so this kind of defect is called scott fit scott key defect where a pair of or a equal number of anions and cations are missing from their normal site so option 4 will not be the answer it's not scott key defect and why option 3 will not be the answer frenkel defect some ions generally cations leave their normal sites and occupy interstitial sites whereas the density of crystal remains the same so there are some sites called interstitial sites which are these white areas in between cations and anions so if one of the cation or anion generally cations which have been seen in frenkel defect leave their site 
vacant while entering into an interstitial site which is non which is in between these atoms which is in the interstitial of the lattice then that is called Frenkel defect while in Scott key we have a pair leaving we have equal number of anion cation leaving their vacant places they are not entering into interstitial spaces but in Frenkel defect we have an anion or a cation entering leaving its site vacant and entering an interstitial space so that is the difference between a Frenkel and a Scott key defect now two more types of defects that we encountered in the question this is an example of interstitial defect so interstitial defect is an addition of an atom in the interstitial site so these gray balls are the correct positions in the lattice while in the interstice there is an addition of impurity or a wrong atom in the point in the interstices of the lattice interstitial defect it is a defect in which atom or molecule occupies intermolecular spaces in the crystals then the interstitial defect is something where the atom goes into the interstice it's similar to frenkel defect but in frenkel defect the atom present in the lattice will vacant its place and go into the interstice while in interstitial defect an atom can come from outside and enter into the lattice at interstitial sites while in vacancy defect there will be a missing atom from the lattice and it will neither enter an interstitial site but it will be gone and that place will be a vacant spot that's what is our answer is called vacancy point defect where during development of the lattice some atoms leave empty spots known as point defects vacancy point defect in vacancy defect when an atom is not present at the lattice site then that lattice site is vacant and it creates a vacancy defect due to this the density of substance decreases because now one atom is missing so the density will decrease and if many such vacancy defect are there then the density of the material will be far less than the original material so the answer to our question will be vacancy defect question was when some lattice sites left vacant while formation of the crystal the defect is called vacancy defect students is it clear the different types of point defects and what are the major differences between them i hope you understood because this is an important concept and it's very easy to uh, remember and understand is it clear to the students you can just let me know in the chat box the difference between frenkel scott key interstitial and vacancy defect oh magesh says uh, please show the previous slide yeah sure so in the previous slide i was talking about frenkel and scott key defect so you can just uh, easily remember it scott key is a defect in which equal number of cations and anions are leaving the sites vacant in a crystal lattice while in frenkel defect one of the cations or anions especially generally it is seen that cations leave their place in lattice and enter interstitial sites right and students do not worry these slides will be provided to you uh, via email from nptel so there will be a google drive in which i'll upload all the sites for you to refer and to understand whatever questions we are solving this session will also be recorded and uploaded on youtube the link will be provided to you via nptel so do not worry and if you have any doubt and anything regarding the discussion that we are having here or the concepts uh, you encountered in lecture week 4 you can just ask me yes magesh thank you thank you too is is it clear to the students then we'll move forward to the next question yes it seems yes yes cool so the next question seventh question we have half an hour more and we have four questions more 7 8 9 10 let's quickly finish it which of the following would happen upon addition of oh groups to a material it's a tricky question and uh, i don't think anybody should have problem in answering this 
students i'll encourage again everyone to participate and give answers it's okay if you do not know the correct answer nobody is going to judge you we will all see what is the correct answer and we'll understand the rational on the concept behind the answers right so please try to answer we have only few questions left and half an hour left roughly which of the following would happen upon addition of oh groups to a material option a will its hydrophobicity increase option b will its hydrogen bonding increase or carbon will remain unchanged option c or all of the above will happen while adding oh group now which of the uh, which of the options are correct what do you think about the answers you can mention in the chat box even if you don't know you can just give a wild guess based on the basic understanding and logic that you have encountered till now it's okay if your answer is not wrong do not feel shy be confident i'll just wait for a minute and collect some answers it's good to see that students are participating and uh, hope we have some time left so that we can take some special doubts i'll just wait for a minute for uh, collecting some answers nice there are there are many answers now komal says one magesh says option a roshan yashwant patel aditi komal louis spurti are going with all of the above okay anuradha says a dhanush says a dhanush says four john all of the above prata says two vivek is saying four okay cool cool we have collected enough answers good to see that now let's see if one of you is correct the answer is hydrogen bonding increases option 2 i think one uh, student answered option 2 he or she is correct I don't remember but good job hydrogen bonding will increase on the addition of oh groups isn't it obvious guys because oh group will increase hydrogen bonding and uh, for your information if you if you are unaware of what is an hydrogen bonding so hydrogen bonding can happen between an electronegative atom and a hydrogen donating group kind of let's say oh minus the o oxygen group is electronegative more electronegative so oh minus can functionalize with a positive charge around it and that will create a hydrogen bonding these are weak interactions transient interaction not like strong covalent bonds or ionic interaction these are different so addition of oh groups will increase the hydrogen bonding of any material right so water alcohols carboxylic acids and many other hydroxyl containing compounds can be readily deprotonated due to large difference between electronegativity of oxygen and that of hydrogen so this is what i was talking about when i uh, when i told you about hydrogen bonding because of these functional groups like water alcohols carboxylic acid and many other oh containing compounds can readily be deprotonated a proton can be extracted from them readily due to large electronegativity difference between oxygen and hydrogen that's why oh group increases the hydrogen bonding due to electronegativity difference of oxygen and hydrogen right and all hydroxy containing compounds engage in inter intermolecular hydrogen bonding increasing the electrostatic attraction between molecules thus to higher boiling point and melting points than found for compounds that lack this functional group even when hydrogen bonding is temporary and transient interaction many amount of hydrogen bonding in large number in large quantity due to presence of these hydroxyl groups can lead to tighter interaction and also increase the melting and boiling points of materials see hydrogen bonding alone one one molecule hydrogen bonding is weak but if you have 100 such hydrogen bonding happening then that is now accounted for a strong interaction in fact hydrogen bonding may be weak but it is one of the major forces 
stabilizing many uh, biological molecules and proteins and enzymes and many materials right organic compounds which are often poorly soluble in water become water soluble when they contain two or more hydroxy groups yes organic compounds which are non polar which are not soluble in water often become soluble in water if they contain hydroxyl groups and here is a representation in context of nanomaterials where a nanotube is hydrophobic we add surfactant which have a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail group this hydrophobic tail will attach to the surface of hydrophobic nanotube and the hydrophilic tail will be outside this can also be functionalized with uh, carboxylic acid oh groups and everything introduction of hydrophilic group and this will make this carbon nanotube or whatever nanotube more soluble so addition of oh group to the nanomaterial makes it more water soluble or more polar due to increased hydrogen bonding is it clear to the students what is hydrogen bonding and why oh group presence will increase hydrogen bonding you can just let me know in the chat box due to electronegativity difference of the oxygen and surrounding hydrogen the oxygen will develop a partial negative charge and it will conjugate with h plus ions increasing through a hydrogen bond which is weak transient but in large numbers can be a formidable force is it clear to the students you can just let me know in the chat cool cool yes yes thanks let's move on to the next question eighth question now this is the characterization technique question which of the techniques cannot be used to visualize topography of a material this might be a tricky question based on characterization of nanomaterials which of these techniques cannot be used to visualize topography of a material option a tem scanning electron microscopy option b tem tunneling electron microscopy option c afm atomic force microscopy option d xps x ray photon spectroscopy a b c d come on students which of the one do you think is the correct answer which of this technique cannot be used to topography of a material i'll give you a hint by topography we, we mean three dimensional three dimensional information about the nanoparticle which of these techniques will not give the three dimensional information is it sem tem afm or xps i have expanded all the terms for you sem stands for scanning electron microscopy tem stands for tunneling electron microscopy AFM is atomic force microscopy and XPS is x-ray photon spectroscopy. I'll wait for a minute to collect some answers. I'll encourage all the students again to uh, participate and answer in this session. We have two more questions left and it will be quickly over. So if you haven't gotten a chance or if you are feeling shy to answer this is the moment. come up and try to you just have to write the answer in the chat box it's it's uh, not a big deal you do not have to shy out i'll wait for a minute to collect some answers okay there are some answers magesh says option d luis roshan uma maheshwari all are with option d komal is confused between afm or xps vivek shweta aditi would be are saying tem john and 
Milan also are going with Tem. Sai Preeti is saying Tem and Anugatha Tem. Okay, so let's see what is the correct answer. So there are two schools of option. Some people are going with XPS. Some people are saying Tem. Let's see what is the answer. The correct answer is XPS. X-ray photon spectroscopy. X-ray photon spectroscopy cannot be used to visualize the topography of a material. I gave you the hint. Topography of a material means the three-dimensional arrangement or the three-dimensional structure information of the material. While SEM, TEM and AFM will all give you three-dimensional information. Let's understand a bit about these techniques. SEM or scanning electron microscopy produces perfect images of the surface of the cells and small organisms. But TEM is suitable to study ultra structure of the cells and components. It shows tiny parts like protein molecule in nano level. So these are the usage of SEM and TEM. They can produce perfect images of the surface of the cell and small organism up to the three dimensional level. And TEM can also resolve ultra structure of the cell and components to nano level. This is a representation of one of these techniques, scanning electron microscopy. We have an electron source or an electron gun, which will channel the electron beam. We have certain lens setups, which are, which are used to focus the electron beam into the scanning coil and objective lens. So here is a sample. So you can see these samples have lot of topography or 3D undulations. The surface is not smooth, right? And when the electron beam hits the sample, may some of it is scattered back, these green arrows. Now this scattering light is caught up by the detector amplified into the signal, fed into the computer, generate a scan of the surface. So the kind of scattering, there are equations and mathematical uh, calculations in which the angle of the scattering, the amount of intensity of the light, uh, uh, intensity of the electrons that have been scattered can all be used to calculate the real topography of the 3D, uh, the 3D undulations and contours of the sample via scanning electron microscopy. This is called SEM. Then the AFM can be used to image the topography of soft biological materials in the native environments. AFM is a different kind of technology which uses a cantilever or, an, or a probe which is a thin fine arm containing a very fine tip. Now this tip can scan through the 3D surface, the sample surface and give us lots of information. So what actually happens is, you shine a laser on the AFM probe and there is a photodiode which will apply, which will control the AFM probe tapping onto the sample surface to create a signal which can, uh, which can let the probe to just scan through the sample surface and record all the in, uh, undulations, depth and height of the sample in the Z direction. So AFM, SEM and TEM can all give us topography of the sample. And then what is XPS? This is a schematic of XPS uh, principle where we shine X-ray onto, onto the surface, onto the sample. And then again, electrons are scattered. Some of it is absorbed. Some of the electrons are scattered. Photoelectronics photoelectrons characteristic of sample surface. So here the sample needs to be glued to the surface and the x-ray light here can just give us the surface information. It will not give the undulations, crest and troughs and the rough surface of the sample. So topographical information will be lost but only surface information can be obtained. So x-ray will penetrate to certain depths some will uh, deflect, some will scatter the electrons, some will, uh, some will deflect the electrons. And whatever photoelectrons that are characteristic of the sample surface will be collected. And that is what XPS studies, the sample surface information. So XPS is a technique 
which analyzes the elements constituting the sample surface its composition and chemical bonding state by irradiating x rays on the sample surface and measuring the kinetic energy of the photoelectrons emitted so xps is generally a surface uh, related technique while afm sem and tem can give us the topographical uh, image topographical information of the material that's why the option for xps is not able to give topographical information on the material that's why option 4 is the correct answer which many of the students have answered correctly well done so is it clear students about the different uh, characterization techniques so what i was trying to tell you was uh, that xps is mostly a surface uh, sampling technique while afm and sem and tem can give higher resolution in topography of the material is it clear to the students you can just let me know in the chat cool cool nice thanks yes let's move on to the ninth question oh we have some yeah that's what i was saying provide surface information only and not 3d topography of the material xps ninth question says it's also a short question contact angle measurement of a sample signifies dash option a volume option b pressure option c hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity option d temperature contact angle measurement what does it measures for a sample it should be easy for you guys if you know what is the concept of contact angle and where do we use such measurements in nanotechnology i'll just wait for a minute to collect few answers you can mention the option which you think is the right answer in the chat box contact angle measurement of sample signifies volume pressure hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity or temperature let's see if there are some answers oh there are many answers nice komal swetha magesh urbi anuradha uma maheshwari vivek luis melan aditi are all going with option 3 sonali says temperature sai priti is also saying temperature i think that's uh, enough answers let's see what is the correct answer the correct answer is option c hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity so as many students have uh, answered correctly congratulations contact angle measurement is a measurement of hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity of a nanomaterial so what is contact angle the contact angle is the angle conventionally measured through the liquid where a liquid vapor interface meets a solid surface so in simple terms the angle that the liquid makes when it is on a solid surface in a vapor environment or in a gaseous environment so that can be in general so if we have a water droplet on a leaf so leaf is the material solid surface water is the liquid and vapor here is meant by air the water droplet makes an angle while landing on the leaf so the angle with which the water droplet inclines with the solid surface of the leaf is called the contact angle for the leaf because we are checking the material hydrophobicity hydrophilicity so that's a simple explanation these are all scientific terms liquid vapor interface through the solid surface 
a contact angle gives us an indication of how well a liquid will spread over the surface of a nanomaterial so this is what i was talking about with an example how well a liquid will spread over the surface of nanomaterial is given by the contact angle on my right is the representation of what we just have uh, learned about contact angle surface of the part to be wetted this black surface can be any part solid surface which have to be wetted or nano material this is a liquid drop wetting angle alpha or contact angle is this angle that the liquid surface makes with the solid surface now if the alpha is 0 degrees that means the liquid is spreading if alpha is less than 90 degree that means it is a good wetting agent if alpha equal to 90 degrees incomplete wetting alpha greater than 90 degrees incomplete wetting alpha greater than 180 degree non wetting so non wetting property is a hydrophobic property while good wetting and spreading property is a hydrophilic property that's how the alpha or the contact angle is a measure of hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity of the nanomaterial surface contact angle measurement is a qualitative way to evaluate whether the surface has a hydrophobic or hydrophilic characteristics so if the surface is more hydrophobic then we'll have this kind of situation where alpha will be greater than 180 degrees and if the surface will be hydrophilic then we'll have this kind of situation in which alpha will be 0 degrees or less than 90 degrees in an acute angle where there is good spreading and good wetting contact angle is based on the observation of the intermolecular interactions between the surface and a small drop of water when the drop meets the surface so whenever the drop drop meets the surface intermolecular interaction between the liquid and the solid phase will determine the contact angle so this is an equation for calculating the contact angle if theta is the contact angle and these are three kinds of forces the drop exerts on the surface y s gamma s here is the solid surface tension gamma l is the liquid surface tension gamma s l is the solid liquid boundary tension so gamma s can be written as gamma l into cos theta plus gamma sl and this equation is known as young's equation which is useful for contacting for calculating contact angle so cos theta theta is the contact angle gamma s is the solid surface tension l is the liquid surface tension and sl is the boundary tension and this is what i was telling low contact angle means high surface energy it means this uh, the material is highly hydrophilic if the contact angle increases or high contact angle low surface energy or the surface is more hydrophobic the nanomaterial is hydrophobic and this is a setup for contact angle measurement in which we have a water dispenser here this black uh, is a sample black thing is the sample or nanomaterial for which we are calculating the contact angle or the extent of hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity we have a light source to shine light and see what is the angle of reflection we have a water drop and we calculate all these forces solid surface tension liquid surface tension liquid boundary tension and this is captured by the camera the light deflection and fed into the computer to get some values of contact angle now using the contact angle and calculations we can calculate what is the hydrophilicity or hydrophobicity of this black nanomaterial. If it is hydrophobic, then the contact angle will be high. If it is hydrophilic, the contact angle will be low. Is it understood? Is it clear? So the contact angle will be a measurement for hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity of a nanomaterial. Is it clear to the students? You can just type yes or no in the chat box or if you want me to re revisit some slide or show you again something or tell you about something you can tell me whatever doubts you have regarding the explanation 
or the practice problem session you can just tell me or is it clear then we can move into the next and final question Yeah, I think uh, Roshan is asking a problem for uh, contact angle. Roshan, currently uh, I do not have a problem set question for this. Maybe in the next quiz, uh, next session we can try solving one. So the practice problem that I was given with to discuss with you guys just had a question about contact angle. I think you guys are pretty smart. If you have values of all these gamma s l and s l it will be an easy task for you to calculate theta based on this equation young's equation for contact angle so i'm afraid i uh, cannot help you in this let's move on to the last question and uh, let me see if i can accommodate one question more in the next practice session right let's move on to the last question Students who do, did not have a chance till answering, please answer. This is the last question for this problem set. We are already approaching finishing time. This is about iron pyrite again. Which of these effects were observed in field trial with spinach by treating seeds with water and aqueous iron pyrite? So in the lecture series, there was a whole lecture based on application of iron pyrite as a nanomaterial and uh, the lecture consisted of spinach treatment with py iron pyrite and the question is related to that i have given you a big hint so option a says higher leaf size in control plants option c b says lower biomass in test plants option c lower calcium in test plants or option d higher chlorophyll percentage in test plants which of these do you think is the correct answer which of these effects were observed in field trial with spinach by treating seeds with water and aqueous iron pyrite? Which of the options will be correct option? Higher leaf size in control, lower biomass in test, lower calcium in test or higher chlorophyll in test? Let's wait for a minute and collect some answers. Okay, so there are uh, there are some answers. Magesh is option A. Sweta, Roshan, Aditi, Louis, Spurti, Vivek, Sonali, Milan are all saying with option four. I would please request all the participants to mute their mics. Yeah, for the smooth conduction of the session. You can talk to me via the chat box. So many people are saying option 4. Some are also saying option A. Higher leaf size in control plants, higher chlorophyll percentage in test plants. Right? So let's see which is the correct answer. So as everybody majorly answered, option 4 is the correct option higher chlorophyll percentage in test plants i am sorry but option a would never be an answer because control plants would not control plants or control experiment setups would not show any change because they are being they are not being given the treatment so whatever the control expression or uh, parameter would be should be remaining constant and iron pyrite enhanced the chlorophyll percentage in test plants so if you recall the iron pyrite experiment spinach experiment this is a summary of iron pyrite spinach experiment so in control spinach seed was treated with water but in test 
spinach seed along with water was treated with iron pyrite nanoparticles iron part and uh, iron particle iron pyrite nanoparticle synthesis was done characterization of the nanomaterial and seed treatment with the nanomaterial so the seeds of spinach were treated with water laden with iron pyrite for test and only water for control and then they are planted in equiv equiv equivalent plots so in similar kind of plots with all conditions all other conditions constant just differing the control and test by via addition of iron pyrite the plants were planted then leaf area leaf area index specific leaf, leaf area analysis dry biomass analysis everything was done to find out what are the changes occurring in the test which are solely induced by addition of iron pyrite because all other conditions were kept constant and control treatment was done to compare it with the test test situation to find out how much increase or decrease what effect iron pyrite had in this experiment or with treatment with growth of spinach seed and what did we see so if you see this curve uh, this plot shows number of leaves per plant and here we see clearly see in control and test the test the ones treated with iron pyrite nanoparticles have increased number of leaves per plant so there are higher number of leaves per plant when treatment with iron pyrite so here if you see it's, this bar is around 15 leaves per plant we have 20 leaves per plant when treated with iron pyrite and this and this option uh, column b shows specific leaf area in square per gram means per gram of leaf how much is the uh, per gram of the plant how much is the leaf area so this is almost similar 70 to 70 control and test while there is an increase in number of leaves of plant and if you see leaf area per plant index and leaf area index there is an increase in size of the leaves here is a representative image in which control leaves and test leaves are compared test leaves are uh, are bigger and broader compared to control leaves test are the ones plants treated with iron sulfide iron pyrite uh, spinach seed and you see almost 20 30 is the control and 50 55 is the test so almost double the leaf area per plant index and leaf area index is also showing while control is at number 1 this is around 1.6 so it's a 1 1.5 fold increase in the test the leaf size also two other fascinating results dry weight and fresh weight of the plant increased in test both in test so dry weight and the biomass so this is a measure of biomass of the plant and upon average concentration calcium is also increasing in treatment with iron pyrite zinc and magnesium are also increasing so these minerals absorption by the spinach is increasing when treated with iron pyrite nanoparticles and also the dry weight and wet weight fresh weight of the plant dry biomass of the plant is increasing and chlorophyll is also increasing via this method so this is a proposed mechanism of action of iron pyrite iron pyrite releases plus h2o releases h2o2 which leads to starch breakdown and brassinocidoid pathway activates in the spinach seed leading to all these phenomena leading to higher leaf area higher chlorophyll content higher number of leaves per plant high increased biomass of the plant and average concentration increase increase in mineral concentration so iron pyrite treatment of spinach led to increase in leaf size as we saw biomass of the plant here in the graph we are seeing chlorophyll content of the leaves presence of manganese and sulfur so iron pyrite nanoparticles treatment was successful in growth of spinach leaves so the answer would be increase in chlorophyll content of the plants is it clear to the students you can just let me know in the chat box 
is it clear to the students we have just uh, finished the last question of this session you can just let me know yeah cool cool so i'll stop presenting and uh, let me turn on my video so students with this we have uh, finished lecture week 4 practice problem set and i hope uh, you guys had uh, a good revision and learning throughout your uh, practice problem set assignment so every week we'll be having consecutively till we reach problem set week 8 so next sunday be ready for problem set uh, with practice problem set for week 5 and uh, it will be better if you go through the lectures and then come to the problem set and participation is very important for you guys to learn so i hope uh, you could take home some important concepts or your doubts had been cleared so do you find the class interesting do you think uh, it is helping you in your nptel course i just wanted to know as a kind of feedback the session is over and uh, i am very happy with the participation students are all already participating so i encourage all the students to participate and uh, try to answer the question the problem session is arranged in such a way that uh, it will be a good revision for you guys while uh, while you are while you are studying with your lectures and uh, please try to attend it if not uh, if you have missed it it's it's okay you can go and watch the recordings so let me just uh, let me just share in the chat box the link to all the videos my youtube channel i have been uploading uh, these videos and all my slides will be available through you via google drive link which will be shared which has already shared to you and will always always come to you guys so do not worry if you have missed any pro practice problem session so these sessions are a replica of your assignments these are not your exact assignment questions so obviously i won't help you solve your assignment questions that is for uh, your test yeah let me share the playlist link here so you can just let me just find out yeah. so here in the chat box i am sharing the link this will also be provided uh, this will be also be provided to you via email you can go through this if you have missed any lecture any practice problem session and uh, keep thorough with your lectures if it's piled up then complete it and you'll be you'll be contacted by the nptel team for the same and uh, hoping you guys hoping to see you guys on next sunday solving lecture 5 week uh, practice problem for lecture 5 i'll end the call now thank you for joining have a good evening Yeah.